welcome to News Laundry, Arun. Uh, for the benefit of our younger viewers and readers who really don't know your history as well as my generation does, uh, you've been an economist, uh, and I think our first activist journalist, uh, politician, writer, author. Uh, have I left out anything? Adit's father. Of course. And it has that's been, been that's been your call. Yes. That's been your call. I would like to mention the kind of exposés you did when you were working in journalism, which was the buying of Kamla, the Bhagalpur blindings. Uh, these were done by Ashwini Sareen. Yes, but you but were the editor and, and guiding them. Yes, yes. And thank you for the <laughs> credit to him. Um, the Antule scam, which you were seriously involved in. The Gundu Rao interview, which was hilarious. You were involved in the defeat of the defamation bill, I think, which also came up because of you. Mm. And then oil scam, which you just explained to me, which was during Sanjay, Sanjay Gandhi's time, time yes. which disrupted the parliament. And it was a kind of a catch-22, which they didn't want to admit why they were disrupting the parliament, because it would then be exposed. But um, so with all these things that you've done, has journalism proved to be an too narrow a tool for you? No, it was a tool which was snatched away. I think uh, it, in the paper could have continued to do good work, but uh, on two occasions when we were really uh, sort of um, doing new things, then uh, in the first instance, Mrs. Gandhi pre uh, put, was able to put sufficient pressure even on a person like Mr. Ramnath Goenka, and that the cases against him would become uh, unbearable. There were like 300 cases against uh, No, India that was in Rajiv Gandhi's time. And, but at that time, Mrs. Gandhi was, the new building was going to be destroyed uh, of, uh, on Bahadur Shah Zafar Mag and all sorts of other cases were income tax and in those days foreign exchange violation of a very small amount could be uh, a very troublesome thing. And uh, that I was the gesture of goodwill, that I, I should see. be sacrificed on that and actually uh, all this was done. Um, and George Verghese in his book gives a completely perverse account of what, he, what happened during that period and what uh, his role was, but that's a separate story. Well, that's uh, the Rashomon. It seems every journalist who's, been, who's writing books has different versions of the same Well, partly events. because memory is very uh, fallible, so I don't want to attribute motives, but here the things are well, so blatant. Memory is poetry, <laughs> poetry <yes. laughs> very well, far from reality. That's, uh, a lot of neuroscience shows that, <laughs> as in a traffic accident. Yes. But here, uh, I think there was some selective um, memory at work that is going on. But anyhow, I was dismissed um, because of that pressure. And um, then, in the sec um, then the paper went into all sorts of difficulties. The circulation collapsed. And Ramnathji sent Guru Muthi to me that, no, you come back. And so that was a wonderful opportunity. But by that time, and uh, we just started doing new work. I then worked on this Mandal Commission, and um, I mean I knew that this would be the ruin of uh, India and of especially of government services. And um, by that time, some persons were conspiring to take over the paper because Ramnachi had had a series of strokes, strokes, yes, and he was not altogether um, coherent. Uh, so they thought that two persons would be the obstacle in their plans and uh, Guru Murthy was one and I was the f uh, other. So on Ramnaji's name, a dismissal letter of five pages or something was written uh, that shocking. you are not conforming to the, uh, the, uh, the editorial line of the paper. I mean, it's all bunk. And who were the people behind this? Um, I named them. Uh, I can, uh, they are all living. They have gone in different ways, but um, but they, and they successfully took over the paper. Actually, you just have to see who took over the paper at that time, who became the editors, who became, in effect, the controllers behind the nominal owner at that time. And uh, I went to Bombay. And Ramnaji was. It's obvious. I, I've dealt with stroke patients, so I know he was not there. So I asked him, Ramnaji, you have dismissed me and he didn't know what has happened. But dismissal is dismissal. And so that it was a 
it was a forum, uh, it was an instrument that was not too narrow, but it was snatched away on two occasions. But we have to learn to put these difficulties to work. But that's why you went more into the writing of books. Books, yes. Then I started writing books um, and, uh, and because of peculiar circumstances, I then thought I'll publish them myself. And one day I got a call and thereby joined the BJP and then Atalji's government came. And in a sense, for no work of mine, but we lost the election and then uh, so I got back to writing books. Your, uh, this book, The World of uh, Fatwas, yes. uh, might I say very humbly that you've been very mischievous <laughs> in this, in using everything that is there yes. in your original ed edition yes. that is already established as the law for, for, the, for Islam. So there is uh, no invention, but in some sense, you've used all that information against them to expose how one unfair, how it supports inequality in every way, and how rigid and dogmatic it is to exclude any development of future intellectual thought or evolution to today's times. So, would you say that you have been mischievous in this? No, uh, you show me another fatwa which uh, you would approve of. I couldn't, no. I was cringing. Yes, so therefore, and you see there are several points in this. I think they are very important issues that you have raised. First, the book was originally written in the mid-1990s. At that time, as you know, Sharia was a very important debating point. Mm. Because they said in the Shah Banu case, yes, yes Shah Banu case, that no, the Sharia does not allow the payment of... Uh, that lady was 73 years old. And she was she getting, what, 500 rupees? No, no, 120 one? rupees. And she had borne four children. She was 73. Her husband was a prosperous lawyer. And he said that he cannot pay that 120 rupees or whatever because it is against Islam. Mm. And Rajiv Gandhi, uh, um, advised by two ministers, uh, went along with that and passed so a that was the continuation or the birth of serious vote bank politics. Politics and uh, I then uh, I had taken interest in that controversy, read up all on the Sharia and what is this uh, Women uh, Islam Marriages Act I had gone into, the clauses, it's a British act and the clauses were modified to appease Jinnah who did not want his properties to go to X but wanted to, them to go to Y. That is how the clauses were made. I reconstructed all that from files in our national archives. But naturally the controversy continued and by that time I had become deeply interested in Sharia. So what the Sharia can be from the Quran, it can be from the Hadiths which are accounts of the Prophet. You know, Madhu met X who says that Arun was there and Arun says, so from a lineage of 20 um, persons, you will say this is what the Prophet did in the circumstance and that becomes the law. Mm. And ulemas are then the they, then in they interpret. interpreted to their own diktats. So what do the ulama say? That's the fatwa. So I then started studying the fatwas. I did not find a single study of the fatwas anywhere in the world. So I took the six great authorities who had been issuing fatwas for about a hundred years in India. I uh, probably s uh, sat with four translators who would read out, we read about 18,000 pages. And this book was the result of that. Now when Harper Collins asked me to update the book, I then looked up the fatwas now. You seriously okay. updated it. You went on the net. Yes. You net. went on the Deoban site. Yes. Got all the <laughs> embarrassing <laughs> questions and answers. No, no, no. These yeah. are the only questions and I answers. No, but they're so yes, I, on edge. But that's <laughs> so that is why one should read them. I the, my point is it is very necessary to understand not Islam in the abstract, not the life of the Prophet, not the Quran only. And how people say that it's a book of peace. Yes, so it's the tough. point would be, what is the mind of the ulema that in a sense sets the discourse and pattern of living in Islamic communities and what is the mind they want to create in the uh, community? 
So that's what the fatwa, which is the high literature of the community, and puts across. You know, one of the recent things that happened yesterday, in fact, the Muslim athletes at the Olympics have been issued fatwas because it's the month of Ramzan. Mm. So they are not supposed to eat. Now, some of them have said that if I'm going to compete in judo, mm. Allah will understand and I will make up for it later by feed, feeding 1,800 people afterwards. Some of them are really not eating. And the explanation for that is that what you're doing is recreation and of choice. There is no, uh, uh, there is no permission for, to do anything for recreation in the Quran. So it is of your choice, there is no need for you to do it. Whereas Ramzan has been, the, the law has been written in the Quran. So you should follow that. Yes. So what we're looking at is a trapped uh, population yes. all over the world, right. trapped in a situation where they are, somet not sometimes, very often, uh, asked to do the most unreasonable things, as, as in your book, the yes. examples that you give, and in the update. Yes. The, it makes, I think, what one reads, and I put myself in their position, it makes life hell. It is, it's impossible. I mean, many of the things are so ludicrous yeah. that uh, one cannot obey them. But you know, there's a very interesting point. What does the liberal say? Or the, what does the politically correct liberal say when you bring up, Are look, look at this. He will say, but who obeys the fatwas? Are that can, I can say, who reads the fatwas? But the question is, we are a few persons in this room, or your viewers, how many of them read Supreme Court judgments? But if there is a dispute, that is the law. So this is the law in action. And uh, you, you people say, oh, we don't have to obey them. But then why ask for them? Mm. Well, some of the things are so strange, like you say one word of talaq, and then the woman enters this Yes. area of a uh, time of uh, purity yes. and then this gentleman has emailed yes. a question uh, that uh, if I show my private parts to no, that I did show them on Skype yes the new and she showed and she breast. showed her breast on Skype yes. so does that mean that we are now impure no not only impure no now that uh, have we to begin the cycle again ah, do we start again because or have we to get married again because you see there's a big technical exactly, point yeah. on remarriage hmm. supposing a husband divorces his wife let's say in dr uh, fury but the divorce is there now he repents and says no i didn't mean it we are married again no 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 she must be married first to another person and that marriage must be consummated and then he, that, mar that new husband must divorce her, then this fellow can remarry her. There's a Malvi here who was caught because he made this a business. Oh, for the divorce and the remarriage ah, and that, that kind he would, of thing. He would arrange <laughs> because he would just have a circulating And animal. in this, the woman, of course, has no, no say. No, no, see. And this is just one of the many examples that you can read. There's a fatwa there on which there were huge controversies, not involving India, fortunately, but the great center of learning, Al-Azhar, the head of their Hadith department, not a small authority, he issued a fatwa. You see, you cannot, the rule is that a lady cannot be with um, persons who are not her relatives. Oh uh, God, that's such are, a horror story. Yeah, really, such an amusing story. It's a horror story. Yes. That then they, the only way they could justify it is no, if the men had to suckle the breast of the woman who was working, so then she became their mother. Mother, yes. And, and what then would be the condition of the man after suckling an, adu an adult man, <laughs> yes. suckling a woman's breast, <laughs> who's his co-worker, yes. who's then supposed to now look at a mother as but, his yes. mother. So that's what it they ask, the, the women then ask that, will he be more excited by that or will he be uh, more, uh, look at us as a uh, mother? And then further controversies arose from that. They also threatened that then my driver who drives me, uh -huh. since you don't allow us to drive, yes. then my driver has to suckle my breast in order yes. to sit in the same car. Is, yes, exactly. So many things went on. Then could it, could the milk be extracted uh, in a tube and then given or has it to be suckled? So the fellow said, no, no, it must be done. And these are the greatest authorities. And they have no knowledge of a woman's functioning because if yes. you're not pregnant or yes, haven't just delivered, yes, I mean, not pregnant, if you haven't just delivered, 
how are you going to invent this? Yes, and the, the women said that, that fluid. these Maoris don't know us, uh, our biology even. Um, so that's the, but that's the great authority. I'll tell you that very gentleman, that w one of the persons on, uh, around whom this whole controversy is, came here, to, uh, visited India, and he was greeted and his uh, photographs in the papers as the great authority from Saudi Arabia who has come here and he's the head of the, uh, you know, the Grand Mosque and so on. But actually that's the type of person who's issuing these fatwas. We don't know who they are. And on the other, these are amusing examples, but there are dangerous examples. And all this literature I got just by going to Jama Masjid. You can come with me now and you will find these gilded volumes lying there. And people say, Are, who reads them? That's the high literature that's being sold yeah, there. That's not the point, whether who reads them. But uh, why do you think there hasn't been such a strong reaction to you? One interesting reaction. You know, uh, I was uh, once uh, for a lecture in Hyderabad, and I was staying in a rest house. Uh, it was a government rest house, and uh, the person there came and said, "Kid, you kuch Muslim students aap se milne aaye." I thought, God, it's going to be a problem now. You know, I said, "Kitne hai?" He said, "You bistis hai." I thought I'd be beaten up. Yeah. So with great hesitation, but what to do? So I went out and it turned out that they had come. They said, we've come to thank you. Thank me? Why? He said, we've read your book. We always ask our Malvi Sahib, what is this book? And he can't give it to us. So we use it for the reform. We are a group like this. More, almost all religions have gone through reformation, yes. including Hinduism with, with Arya Samajism yes, yes, yes. and Christianity. But and this remember, one has and there's a very interesting point. Stuck. Uh, well, that's one point. The other point is, please remember that whenever the reformers spoke up, it, the uh, thing was, it, has of, it is causing offence. All reform causes offence because the tekedars are offended. That will undermine their point. Yes. And uh, second, that the every community has developed, the communists had developed. If you wrote something critical about the Soviet Union, they said it's a World Bank agent. Now, if a communist person who had been a communist himself wrote, let us say, Milovan Jelas, mm -hmm. Jelas these great dissenters, they said, oh, ho, but he's crossed the barricades. Okay. So either way, he's a kafir and therefore we don't have to take him seriously. Now, unfortunately, as you rightly said, Islam has got stuck there. And um, eventually, it will be the progress of other communities which will then lead to self-reflection. Well, you have mentioned that uh, in your book, that instead of whining and complaining, which is similar to what uh, Moynihan said about the blacks, similar to what Reagan also said, and funnily enough, what Obama said during his election campaign, that we have to stop blaming other people yes. and educate ourselves, get in with uh, uh, competing with other people, and by holding back education, that's the worst thing you can do for yourselves. And that's one of the things you suggested. Yes, one in the is book. education, the other is in India, the very hopeful sign of the emergence of new professions. Actually speaking, let's say that if there is a Muslim cameraman, or a Muslim that you are interviewing, he is violating the law because pictures, pictures are, are not, allowed. not allowed. But it's a new profession and similarly in films we have very good stars who happen to be Muslims. Uh, for, as you said for recreation during Ramzan, well, we have very good players uh, in cricket who are Muslims. Nobody looks upon them as Muslims. And uh, when, when the success of those is visible, Muslims don't say we have been discriminated against, that's why they are successful. So these new professions themselves will erode much of this uh, nonsense. Now in so much, we have so much material in Hinduism, yes. from Upanishads, the Veda, I mean there's extraordinary amount of material. One tiny one which say an Islamist could pull apart is the Manusmriti. Well, partly because nobody has read Manusmriti. But have when you, you read it, yes, I have yes. read parts of it. Parts. And it is as uh, yes. cringe creating. It, it's very interesting. And therefore, when you tell a Hindu, take Gandhiji. 
So, uh, it is said that Manu Smriti says, though I have not been able to find the verse, but it is said that if a Shudra hears the Vedas, molten lead should be poured into his ears. They say it is said there. I have not come across the uh, passage. But anyhow, let us assume it does. And you tell that to Gandhiji. What does he say? He says that if untouchability is sanctioned, is mentioned or sanctioned in any scripture, burn the scripture. Well, you see, this is the thing about Hinduism. Yes. Everything is, uh, is up for argument, for debate, even the meaning of Om. I mean, if yes. you ask oh, 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 10 uh, 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 Hindus, what is the meaning of Om, you will get possibly 15 versions. That was what was so exasperating to the missionaries. <laughs> they could not grab the air. But that is also the uh, secret for reform, for a continual mutation exactly. of the religion and adaptation. So all religions in which the proposition is truth is simple, it has been given by a God to one person, he has put it down in one book, that dif book is difficult to understand, so you require an intermediary, it is the duty of that intermediary to offer the dawat of the Quran to you, of that book to you and if you do not accept it, then it is his duty to put you out of harm's way. This is one set of things right up to communism. In our case, no, truth is very complex, it is like compared to onion, it has not been revealed to one person, no book. There are guide books, tour guides written by persons who traverse that path. Mm. Philosophy, lifestyle and all… Dance, everything. And for so, you to interpret. Uh, uh, yes. To choose uh, in fact. Uh, yes. And what is the criterion? Not your fidelity to a verse in the book, to let us say to Manusmriti, but to your own darshan, to your Conscience. own experience. Mm -hmm. What is right, what is wrong, yes. make your choice. And so that's how… And Gandhi examples of right and wrong. In Gandhiji's case, there is a very good example I have given in various places. You see. The orthodox said, you swear by the Gita. The Gita is set in the middle of a battle, war, mighty war. Arjuna does not say in the end that, oh, I will now sit on uh, uh, Satyagraha. He says, I will now f kill and be killed. So where do you derive this non-violence from? From here. Yes. Gandhiji said from, said from here. here. Yeah. That is what Hinduism is about. That and he it has said to that come this, is, this is uh, my, what I have written in Anishakti Yoga is the unremitting, uh, is the result of the unremitting effort to live the Gita in my life. Now, you have written that when such ideologies take up arms, they have to be defeated and defeated decisively by arms. But that is never enough. Two further things are necessary the ideology must be defeated by ideology. But can it be defeated by ideology or rational, uh, ideological argument or rational argument when it brooks no argument? That is a good point. Therefore, uh, firstly, I mean, the Islam's uh, nature is faith, blind faith and obedience. But is it, uh, the, uh, if we abstract from Islam for a moment, think of communism. It does not today attract that kind of emotion. Therefore, we can consider it more dispassionately. Communism had to be defeated decisively, not militarily necessarily, but in every way, that it just collapsed. Then everybody now, nobody even tries to rationalize communism. Sim uh, similarly, but the ideological struggle at that time of, yes, communism was also resistant to all new thought to all argument, to all evidence. The Indian communists were justifying the massacres of Stalin and of Mao. But it was very necessary to continue that process of dialogue, of going on putting forward evidence and argument. And then hope, and then be confident actually, that you will be vindicated by time. That is what happened. Well, hopefully in the case there of are more young uh, Muslims like the men who the young men who came to meet you, yes. who would then be able to... There are, you know, this Harsan Ali, this lady, everywhere, um, if you go to the internet, you will find a, a Freedom Org, uh, an organization, some uh, Sinai or Sani. They have several scholars who are writing, Ibn Warak, 
these people are writing as Muslims about the Quran, very scholarly uh, material, and they are pointing out all this out. And there is no other way, you know, they are just denounced, they are uh, excommunicated. But the internet and other uh, yes. media now are so impersonal that you can't locate the man. I want you to look at the graph of Hinduism in a sort of quick, quick way. Before Ayodhya, the perception of the Hindu man, particularly, was of a very passive individual. There were jokes on, in other communities about Hindu ko uh, thappar lagao, to he'll say, ek bar aur lagao, phir mein bataunga, then phir ek bar aur lagao, phir ek bar bataunga. And they, we were known as a passive community. After the Yath Yatra, which LK Advani undertook, and the destruction of the Dhancha, the Babri Masjid, whatever, they emerged a more aggressive Indian. Do you think, and there was a lot of violence, do you think we could have gotten to that self-confident Hindu without that kind of mindless aggression and uh, violence? Uh, well, you know, actually, it was the aspiration of a person like Swami Vivekananda. He wrote that, I want somebody with a Hindu soul but an Islamic body. I want the Hindus to be that way. Mm -hmm. That aggressiveness, okay, that self that. yes, That's that amazing. was very important in uh, Vivekananda's case. And he said that you will uh, become like that. Better, more, uh, be, it is better for you that you don't read the Gita but play the football. <laughs> <laughs> so that he wanted the extrovertish uh, activities to come up and social uh, teamwork, for instance, as in football, not introspective work as in reading Gita. And uh, in a sense, the British would not have called the Hindus passive when Gandhiji and Lokman and Tilakanath was reading. But that's my point. He did, he, Gandhiji created a confident Indian without making them necessarily physically aggressive. Yes. And I think therefore the 50 years of secularist discourse took away all that and made the majority community itself defensive because the conditions of everybody else Take the phrase Hindu rate of growth. It's a nonsensical phrase put out by Raj Krishna, but it became the fashion. When it's, the country started growing at 9 or 10 percent, on such a committee's report, the Muslims were not growing. So it was only the Hindus who were growing. Did anybody say that this 9 rate, 9 percent rate of growth is the Hindu rate of growth? No. It is the secularist discourse. Which, uh, which well, actually what's happening in Europe and America now, we can call it the Christian rate of growth. Ah, nobody calls it that. Yeah. So it was uh, this perversity and the caving in of the state in, um, to Bhindranwale, uh, to um, this uh, Shahbuddin on Rushdie, to this Shah Bano business. In, it was this caving in which then legitimized the Ayodhya movement. You said so you cannot say that it was only one aggressive leader who made India, uh, the in Indian Hindu confident. It was the bending of the state which alarmed uh, the majority of the um, country and they said this is terrible, it must stop and Ayodhya became the symbol of that. And Madhu, I'll tell you something. Uh, I was astonished to, learn, uh, to hear from Mr. Kushwan Singh's column that Kuldeep Nair once told him and that this is how Kushwan Singh stopped seeing me. He said that uh, it was complete that Arun Shuri has said that the masjid is not si. But I have always been writing before the mosque was destroyed that it will be destroyed not because it is a disputed structure. As Advani and others are saying it will be the mosque will be destroyed because it is a mosque. Mm -hmm. It has become the symbol and that's exactly, and I was therefore warning, please do not appease. So talking about this culture of appeasement, you've written that in 1984, Ram Sarup told you, yes. if the state neglects its primary right. duties yes. and fails to act firmly, there is bound to be a reaction in society. The violence against Sikhs was induced by the Congress, but because of their suppressed grievances, the Hindus appropriated that violence. The same could be said of the Gujarat, Gujarat 2002. Yes. It was so a very cruel thing. I remember how upset I was that evening uh, because this was said in the midst of the, uh, in the riots 
of the 1984 riots. 1984 riots. That evening we had met Sitaram Goyal, Ram Sarup and I, we were together. Ram Sarup said this to me. He was a very perceptive man, a very passive man uh, in the sense of complete non-violence. He was really truly a Gandhian, but a very, uh, uh, a very uh, man of great insight. He said, no, it's like that. But so the resentment against uh, the special concessions given to uh, communities came out at that time. But intellectually, how does that explain the depraved behavior, the, the, the kind you of see, extreme... When, when these things happen, then uh, you and I will not be in the forefront. Then the persons who will really drink and nashe mein jo marna, kisi pe human being ko marna, it's not a... a but the same human thing, being... The same human being wouldn't do it alone because then it would be murder. Mm -hmm. But then, as yes. you know, a mob. again, yes. Hannah <laughs> Arendt's <laughs> banality of evil, that an atmosphere is created to say that it's okay to do it. It's okay, uh, yeah, and it's all done in a frenzy of, you know, uh, so that a person works himself, the mob works itself into a frenzy. Tell me one thing, uh, um, Arun, uh, think of another scenario. After Godra, the burning of the train, supposing hypothetically, Narendra Modi took a different course. Instead of creating the banality of evil atmosphere, he in fact controlled the city but went after the murderers of the Hindu Karsevaks in the worst way, maybe went to the extreme of hanging them publicly, immediately. Today he'd be viewed as a very different leader. He'd be, I would imagine, less controversial. It could be. Could be. Uh, and I would not, uh, you know, uh, and I would not be able to say what the circumstance at that time was. But as you are saying, there could be two ways of doing it. If, if somebody could identify, could be in the sadhmiyoni, in panch sadhmiyoni kiya, and in ki summary trial karo, and then hang them. Naturally, everybody would want that. That should be the way. But the way but it went, aren't we falling into? Aren't we being lured into a, a game of violence? Oh, you see, because at that moment, rational calculation doesn't, you know, people can't sit and say, Ab main ye karunga, phir wo hoga. It is a, an, a madness that seizes people. And uh, you know, I have learned, both in the case of 1984 in Delhi, which I saw at first hand, I was in the India Today office at the Uchhatpar uh, and we were seeing the smoke yeah. rise and then mm -hmm. we went around. But, um, and in, in, uh, in, uh, in learning about Godra, that the persons on whom we rely to protect, to maintain order at that time, let's say the average policeman, he is actually a part of the same frenzy mm -hmm. because he is of the same community. And whatever is boiling, coming to a boil within the community, comes to a boil, is also coming to a boil within that force. You've That's written, the danger. You've written that not an eye for an eye but both eyes, not a tooth for a tooth, but the whole jaw. So, but you also have and in many not, of your but books. That's not, but that is not about um, uh, internal peace. That is said in reaction to what happened in Bombay, which I maintained at that time. What you call justified violence? I mean, in response yes, to in that? Yes, in response. Certainly, if Pakistan does all that, then naturally that's my formula for Pakistan, mm -hmm. that we must do in Balochistan and Kashmir. That's not the situation today. But that is the situation in 2611. And I have long, for, uh, you know, this peace mongering by Vaga border per Mumbatiya Jalana, ya every Prime Minister of India feeling obligated that I must do something when the other fellow, bhai, I mean, Zulm He's plotting hai, to start a war in Kargan. Not only plotting, he's, yes, exactly. But everybody feels. So, uh, and everybody feels that he has the talent, which the other fellow didn't have, his predecessor, that he can work the exactly. miracle. Yeah. That we should look at the, uh, the um, uh, locus of power and the locus of discourse in Pakistan. And if, yes, if they change, if you see that, yes, it has gone out to the army and ISI, it is truly a democratic yes. country. And the people at large have not internalized those extremist notions of Islam and uh, the hatred for India, then fine, no problem. I don't know if you're familiar with Twitter. On Twitter, in 
on that scene there is what is now called the internet hindu this is an army oh, really? very aggressive abusive and um somehow when one sees of what is happening around the country the sexual molestations on women on young girls all the cops uh you know dictators we are going through a rather tum turbulent social time in terms of safety factors of what where women can go what is happening in 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 terms of sheer violence what do you think i mean hasn't the aggressive indian sort of reduced the indian of from say the words of vaishnav janata where the nobility of man is extorted of how to be the real man and has been reduced to this kind of petty violence and petty abuse whereas that nobility which is written in all our scriptures which we are exhorted to become has just disappeared right so uh, i uh, i am strongly opposed to all these things uh, and i think the media is doing a very good job of exposing these cups and exposing that fellow in mangalore who used to attack exhibitions it he was taking money for that so that is not they are, those fellows are giving hinduism a bad name and we must even from the purely religious point of view treat them as persons who are trying to who are in effect not trying to in effect undermining hinduism on the other hand i also feel that those fellows must be treated as common criminals you know if you molest a, uh, a lady if you in the name of honor of a uh, panchayat they what uh, they are criminals we say this about honor killings, killings in pakistan if they happen in india then we are the same as them exactly. so uh, i would treat them with a very strong hand of the law and really and i would justify it as not just as a liberal but as a person who says that this is against our traditions and we must preserve our traditions in this uh, manner of tolerance of openness I mean, what did we gain i mean uh, i can say many things about hussain's paintings but uh, in the end everybody who was uh, trying to be a big fellow uh, should really reflect on the fact that a uh, good artist a good uh, certainly a very good and humble man usko bahar nikal kar humne kya paya to but arun i do have a question on that that he painted hindu yeah, gods and goddesses no, I, why didn't no, he paint allah no so uh, that i why that precisely that precisely question that precise question i have asked he in follows a book people. no in a book that i have done uh, on this i have asked about to send and that's what i meant that i could say many things about to send but the point in the end would be whether you should not have a discourse exactly. talk talk about what do we become ha ah, well what talk talk to him about it what do you think of narendra modi as a leader he has certainly on all counts done very good work in development very good work no doubt in that now kuldeep nayar wrote in his recent book that he had advised vajpayee to when he went to gujarat to admonish modi about the violence that took place afterwards and kuldeep nayar wrote that he had kind of agreed with him that he would do so and when after he visited the camps he was very um, upset with modi and in fact told him off and shouted at him and then there was a flight to goa apparently where uh, vajpay sat between you and arun jetli no no jetli was not there he was not there mm -hmm. well uh, uh, according to just for the kuldeep nayar thing we forget him i am the i witness to the whole okay. thing not so only that let me get to his uh, accusation he said that although he had kuldeep nayar had convinced him of everything arun shori who was sitting next to vajpay brainwashed him the other way and by the time he got down he was it again it shows it shows kuldeep nayar's uh, usual nonsense i tell you why <laughs> because actually speaking before that mr vajpay went to amdabad uh, to the uh, uh, to the refugee camps he came back he was very upset within few days he went to singapore laos and cambodia and i was the minister accompanying him in that period he expressed his grave um, distress at all this we had many conversations on this i have narrated them uh, earlier in public and the idea was that he would ring up advani ji that before i come back narendra modi should have resigned that did not happen he did not call then 
आई गॉट ए कॉल सिंह कि भाई अब आके एकदम वो गोवा में नेशनल एग्जीक्यूटिव की मीटिंग है एंड यू शुड यू हैव टू अकम्पनी हिम द प्लेन तो क्योंकि अडवाणी जी भी वहाँ होंगे तो मोदी का मैटर मैटर सेटल कर लेना चाहिए आई से अरे भैया अगर वो अडवाणी जी और uh, अटल जी हैं तो विद इन नो बडी शुड बी देयर ही से नहीं जसवंत सिंह भी होगा नो यू मस्ट गो एंड ब्रिंग अप द सब्जेक्ट बट वाई वॉन्ट टॉक ही से दे वॉन्ट टॉक मैन यू गो सो अडवाणी जी अटल जी जसवंत सिंह एंड मी एंड इट वॉज टू आर फ्लाइट एंड इन दैट फ्लाइट देर इज नो डाउट दैट इट वॉज डिसाइडेड दैट टू थिंग्स दे वुड बी टू चेंजेस एंड अडवाणी जी वुड कम्युनिकेट दीज द प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ द बी जे पी एट दैट टाइम मिस्टर जे कृष्णम उर्ति क्या नाम था हु वॉज अवर लॉ मिनिस्टर ऑल्सो वेरी फाइन पर्सन ही वुड रिजाइन एंड वेंकैया नायडू वुड बिकम द प्रेजिडेंट एंड अडवाणी जी वुड इन्फॉर्म नरेंद्र मोदी दैट ही हैज टू स्टेप डाउन दैट एक्चुअली हैपन्ड इन द इवनिंग मीटिंग नो ही हैड बिन अर्ली अ टोल्ड and in the evening meeting while the proceeding was going on at vani ji and atul ji and uh, uh, janak krishna murthy the president were sitting on the stage yashwant sinha bhairav singh shekhawat and i were at the end of the hall narendra modi got up and said that i don't want the party to suffer on my account in any way and therefore i will i am going to resign from the um, party and 20 30 persons started shouting ki bilkul aise nahi ho sakta and um atul ji was visibly uh, non plast ki what has happened this decision was taken so i raised my hand in the national executive and said to all these 200 300 people who were there that what mr narendra modi has just said is in pursuance of the decision that the two leaders sitting there have taken in the flight i was personally present the shouting resumed there was i mean for a moment there was a silence because people were surprised because i narrated what had happened and then the shouting resumed and uh, atul ji then said ke niche diye fir ab public meeting pe chalte hain ne aur adwani ji said ke ab public meeting pe chalte hain fir baad mein nirnay kar lenge logon ne kaha nahi 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 nirnay nirnay ke hi hai ki wo rahenge so i have actually described that as a coup against mr bajpay earlier so i don't know where this so kuldeep nayar get this story that arun shuri isi tarah ki jaise usne bechare mr kushwant singh ko kaha ki bhai wo kehta hai ki wo masjid nahi thi when i was when i was on record for many times over saying ki it will be destroyed because it is a mosque so what um, to do i don't what is your how do you, how would you define the concept of hindutva I don't know the meaning. So all know. right then let's go this way. The BJP has used religion by bringing it into politics. Uh, in a way, in a sense, the main point I think of the RSS has been that the identity of India is essentially religious. That is uh, nobody can dispute that, that the Indians are essentially religious. and the religion indic religions are essentially out of the this great banyan tree of hinduism you have to take buddhism jainism sikhism they arise from this and it was always said that indian islam is very different from islam outside and that is part that is partly must be because of its interaction with hinduism over a long period so the essential identity being religious becomes essentially the hindu religion that has been their view and therefore hinduism should not be put on the defensive Now that's when we talked about uh, the aggressive in the birth of the aggressive indian which yes. is i think which so is the, the bjp d- comes in very late into all this or the jansang comes in very late into all this and uh, i would not think that they are a particularly religious party no, no. but they have used symbols of of uh, the but hindu are religion ayodhya 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 but because all the other symbols were actually the anti uh, uh, anti appeasement symbols mm mm-hmm. after all if i say they should not be article 370 it's not really hindu it is if you look at the origin of the yeah. article and the uniform civil code is like yes. yeah these are not particularly hindu supposing i said that yes the hindu undivided family which is just a tax dodge is this 
एंटी हिंदू इज इट एंटी प्रो इस्लाम इज इट एंटी इस्लाम नो इट्स अ मैटर ऑफ माई असेसमेंट ऑफ टैक्स लॉज बट दी एवरेज इंडियन एसोसिएट्स द बी जे पी एज स्पेशली वेन इट्स फर्स्ट बाईन बाई अदर्स नो वेल इवन वेन से वेन आफ्टर अयोध्या you uh, the average indian would feel they are voting for hinduism by voting for the bjp well i always took that vote to mean they are voting against appeasement of anybody actually speaking that is a very good phrase equality for all and appeasement to none and that is not a particularly B- the bjp says it and it is interpreted me, uh, to mean oh muslims go down karo that's not the case किसी को अपीज नहीं करना चाहिए जैसे कि आपने कहा कि भाई दोस्त के दीज खप्स वप्स डोंट अपीज देम डोंट अपीज अ मैन हु डिस्ट्रॉयज पेंटिंग्स बट यू आर अपीजिंग देम जस्ट एज यू आर अपीजिंग शाही इमाम नॉट बिकॉज इज मुस्लिम बट बिकॉज ही प्रॉब्ली कंट्रोल द फ्यू वोट्स इन वन एरिया ऑफ डेली बट टू टू पॉइंट्स आई वॉन्ट टू क्लोज विद क्वेश्चन आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क यू वन डू यू सी another method in which we can create a deeper loyalty in muslims where country comes before religion other than just beating them into it and secondly uh, let me uh, i let you answer that first no nobody can be beaten into loyalty so if they succeed in india in, in which there are manifestly fair opportunities for everybody they will also see For instance after 1971 in Kashmir they did not see that they have an alternative in joining Pakistan at the same time if we give good administration in Kashmir that's the way but if we give poor administration in Kashmir and then attribute what they are doing to Islam that is wrong so a fair and prosperous society is one way Uh, in which loyalty will be there secondly not to be defensive and self conscious ke bhi ye musliman hai ye hindu hai ye we say we should be secular then please be secular you know i am sure that thousands of what is now called the internet hindu tribe will be watching you and every word very very carefully yeah. examining it <laughs> analyzing it so i would like to ask a question for them which is what is the way forward for them to be confident in their religion but not i mean how can we evolve the noble indian these are young people ready to be formed the leadership has not responded there is no leader who's actually created like gandhi ji did that this is what you can be this is what you should aspire aspire to be as a human being that element has disappeared Yes. As far as uh, basing themselves in religion, if we are talking of that, not what they should be doing in general, and, and it is not necessary to abuse anybody. That's the first point. Second is, please learn about other traditions. Third, please learn about our own traditions. I think much of it is really just breast beating yes. and shouting at somebody else. So learn. We will be transformed if when we see. Ram Krishna Paramhans. When we translate Raman Maharishi into our lives, when we see what kind of a person Gandhi ji was, what his roots were, so learn about our own tradition. And third, in actually, learn from these persons. I tell you, in what way? Wh- which persons? The, the any one of these. Uh, Swami Dayan oh, Saraswati, okay. Swami uh, Ram Krishna Paramhans, uh, Dayan um, uh, Shri Aurobindo, um, Swami Vivekananda. Raman Maharishi Gandhi ji what did they do they did not read manu smriti and said no no this is enforce this they actually i have compared them to algebraists who left the expression within the brackets unchanged and just changed the sign outside mm. it became complete the meaning became completely reversed prayer it was not petitioning gandhi ji gave it a different meaning Raman Maharshi gave it completely different meaning. Similarly, uh, sacrifice. I can find you uh, passages uh, of ritualistic Upanishads in which sacrifice is animal sacrifice. But Gandhi ji, no, 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 not sacrifice of the animal. It is the sacrifice of the ego. 
So that's the beauty of the interpretation. That yes. So therefore, the second point would be know your tradition and reformulate it. It's this. This is what we have lost. Come I think, to your own conclusions. I think the we only two reformulators in the last few years have been only two surprising. One is Swami Chinmayanand and the other, to everyone's surprise, Acharya Rajneesh. They were re reformulating it, Chinmayanand, from within the tradition, like Gandhiji and Raman Maharishi and all. And Ram, uh, Rajneesh is really as an outsider who's reformulating all traditions. You're talking about Osho. Osho, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. but he, uh, Rajneesh brought in all Buddhism, uh -huh. Zen, so, uh, everything, everything. So what I'm saying, is although he was quite these not that, uh, they were reformulating good to traditions. Christianity. So we, should, we should learn to reformulate, and finally, please live the tradition. We don't live that tradition in India. Look at the state of our temples. How unclean they are! Well, is that our tradition? Gandhiji refused to go to temples after going to the Kali temple in Calcutta. He would not go. In Kashi, Vishwanath refused to go. He said, it is so unclean. So, supposing we were to clean our temples, that would be a great contribution. And finally, please be humble and learn from others also. It is a great tragedy, I'll tell you. Buddhism is an Indian tradition. We have had the Tibetans here, 200,000 of them in India now for 50 years. They have preserved a part of our tradition as the Dalai Lama always says. But if you want the translation of a Tibetan text, which is the translation of a Sanskrit text, which we have lost, you have to go to the translations published by the University of Washington. That's really abominable. We have not been humble Shameful. enough to learn from the great masters who have been gifted to us by China. So, learn our tradition, live our tradition, continue to have the confidence to reformulate our tradition. In reformulating them, be humble enough to learn from everybody. That would be our tradition. Our first step to creating the new hopeful, hopefully the new Indian nobility. Yes, rather than doing the easy thing of shouting at others. Thank you very much, Arun. Thank you.